you know, for the, her generation, it's a question, well, will we have kids? Would we want to have kids? Would we have a normal enough life that that made any sense? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what's, what's the world going to be like in five years when I get out of grad school? Presumably there'll be jobs and, you know, you, you, you make a lot of assumptions about the future that allow you to at least nominally, rationally organize your life to proceed into the future. But with this heightened degree of uncertainty, it's like, hmm, um, you know, how much of this, how much does this make sense? In the 2000s, in, early 2000s, uh, that a negative change is a change you can't change. That's what makes it negative. When a loved one dies, when you get a terminal illness, or when the bank you're working for decides that they're going to merge with another bank, and then they did tell you that half the jobs are going away. And you're at the level in the bank where you don't get to choose whether this is happening or not. You don't get to choose about whether you get it happens to you or not, or your group or not, you know. And so anytime there's a, a you know, kind of a, a change, a negative change, a change you can't change, you go through the whole grief cycle. And one of the really shocking things to me, you know, back in 2015 into 16, was realizing what this impacts with the future. It, again, being Buddhist, it's one of those things I've known for years, decades, that my life is of finite duration. If you happen to notice, it's like my teacher's teacher was fond of pointing out, very few people make it to 100. Nobody makes it to 200. It just doesn't happen. So individually, you know you're going to go, you know. But the collapse stuff is really the loss of the collective future. It's the thing that there won't be a seventh generation down the pike. There might not be a third generation down the pike, depending on how long the time scale is of that and all. And, you know, the shock of that was for me quite an experience. And I went through, you know, personally, a whole grief process of that, that, you know, first is the shock and then is the anger and it's the classic stuff because it induces that kind of response in people. And the, the more catastrophic the change is, and the more you can't change it, I think the more that induces that, you know, that just amps up the response. I'm Dean Walker, and welcome to the Poetry of Predicament podcast, a podcast for people brave enough to face humanity's challenges and problems, and most importantly, our numerous predicaments. The Poetry of Predicament is a podcast meant to inspire us to bring forth grace, beauty, and connection with the web of life in the face of a predicament-laden world. In this episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast, let's explore what it is to create practices in this, the most challenging time in human history, with a backcountry skier, a practicing Buddhist, a collapse-aware parent, and a heck of a nice guy. Let's talk with Tim Rempel. Welcome back to the Poetry of Predicament podcast. And I am once again speaking with someone that I think has a, a considerable amount to say about um, a couple of different perspectives on what's going on right now, which is again, uh, April, of 2020. And I, I believe, do believe that we're going to remember, all of us are going to remember 2020, no matter when we were born, as long as we had some amount of consciousness in 2020, we are not going to forget it. This is the great turning point. This is the place where collapse aware people, even uh, people who've been at this topic for decades, this is uh, really the the moment that we've all been dreading or predicting or in some some twisted way looking forward to and tim rempel um had the chance to meet you a couple of years back in boulder in uh one of the prototypes of a workshop carolyn baker and i uh, were putting together at the time and uh, really a pleasure to stay in touch with you, um, particularly recently because of these times, the, the kind of turning up the heat to the nth degree that we're in. 
And so there are two ways that I was hoping to talk with you tonight and really open, I invite you to just share in either one or choose one and go with it, whatever you would choose. But um, you're an extremely collapse aware person. I've always uh, learned a tremendous amount when we, when we chat. And I also just recently found out that you are a parent and that qualifies you to be uh, also part of a secondary uh, special focus podcast called Take My Hand, Conscious Parenting in a Time of Stolen Dreams. And uh, so I'd, I'd love to post this interview with you in both The Poetry of Predicament and Take My Hand. So um, really, thanks for taking out time from we all have busy indoor lives now and most of us are on the screen way too much so thanks for taking a little more time on screen with us well my pleasure my pleasure yeah so i'm curious you know i, I just kind of laid out a wide open invitation for you was there anything that that kind of jumped up and wanted to be addressed first in your from your perspective well a number of things you touched on there, Dean, you know, trigger thoughts. Um, one of them, just starting with, like you said, we're recording this in April of 2020. Um, and I live just up the road from Boulder um, in Longmont. And this week was going, going to be at CU Boulder, the Conference on World Affairs that has been there for decades. This year, obviously, everyone is not flying in. They are doing some sessions uh, on Zoom. We all live on Zoom nowadays. And one of them, uh, they do one a day. And one of them this week was talking about how, yes, indeed, very likely we will all remember 2020. Because the degree to which the situation is, you know, first of all, worldwide, you know, unlike 9 11, which impacted the United States and specifically Im impacted more locally than that, you know. Um, and was, you know, no doubt a, a, an insanely traumatic thing if you were in New York City that day, just off the charts beyond description. But if you were in LA that day, you watched it on the TV. This is rolling out across the whole world, essentially simultaneously, you know. And it's doing something that, um, you know, all the resistance movements and I'm you know, like Extinction Rebellion and all those, in some sense could only hope to do in terms of bringing the economy to a screeching halt, again, worldwide, in an absolutely unprecedented way. Um, and if you are collapse aware, and yeah, just so people kind of know a little bit about my background, just very quickly in summary, uh, really got into that about 2015 and started um, I'm an avid skier. I'm outdoors a lot in the winter up in the high country of Colorado. Uh, and had seen the changes and became more aware of it. Um, got plugged into Dar Jamail's work on Truth Out back in 16 and 17. Ended up being his, one of his field correspondents reporting to him oh, a couple, three times a winter about what was going on, particularly in uh, Summit County and Eagle County. So kind of west of Denver and Vail, that sort of area, and then other parts like down south in Telluride, and one winter Telluride had the craziest winter they'd have ever had, you know. Um, so we've sort of seen the slow unfolding train wreck. And it does seem like a, both a, it's a wreck, and it's uh, sort of a train wreck in the sense that it just continues on, might even be accelerating. Uh, sometimes it's a little hard to tell, but certainly doesn't seem to be slowing down. Um, and he's slow because, you know, um, it really kind of is for us sort of the, you know, the, the proverbial, uh, frog in a pot of slowly heating water. Whereas the COVID thing just bam, just, you know, in an extremely short period of time, it seems like just, you know, uh, a period of just a few months exploded. And yeah, for those of us that are collapse aware, it's like, my goodness, this really sort of reveals what's what's going on, um, you know, with the world and is is in some sense maybe a prelude to what lies ahead. Um, the uh, scientist warning folks sent out a great graph the other day 
that had the unmitigated response curve of the coronavirus, the so-called spread out or you know flatten the curve, and then against it was the upward going curve of number of deaths over time from climate change. And it really struck me that that's, that's the situation we're in. Um, so that's kind of a, a, a background about me a little bit and, and that stuff. Um, yeah, I do have a couple kids. Um, I was thinking about that the other day, kind of in preparation for this a bit. Uh, in 2015, uh, the oldest was in college and the younger one was in high school. And has been interesting uh, working with them um, since then um, about this. Um, and as a lot of us are collapse aware experience, um, it's not easy to talk to other people about. You know, it's a very tough conversation. It's not one that's often well received because they'd rather talk about something else. Can we talk oh, you about mean, almost you mean anything else? Anything else? Yeah, I, yeah. I think I've been countered that a few hundred thousand times. I'm with you. <laughs> yes. yes, because it's and and you know the, it, it's interesting. Another um, piece of my background mm -hmm. is uh, I'm Tibetan Buddhist. Um, Lately, I've been last year or so, you know, a couple of years maybe, um, involved with the eco dharma world. Uh, I have a good buddy, David Loy, uh, who's notable in there. And his book, um, his latest book, is a really good one about about the the eco crisis from a Buddhist perspective. Um, and he's a Zen teacher. And one of the things he points out is an ancient Zen principle of it, as I understand it, it's referred to as not knowing mind. And it's the whole idea that you might think you know things, but when it comes to the future, you really don't. And you can make, you can surmise that things are not headed in a good direction, but exactly what it'll be like a week from now, well, you're not quite sure. And what will be a month from now, you're even less sure. And a year from now, you're even less sure still, and so forth. So the thing that's tough about it is hanging in that state of not knowing mind because you don't know. And because you don't know, it's like you can't talk to your kids with certainty. You know, okay, the world's going to end on, you know, April 27th, 2036, you know. You know, we certainly don't have that kind of specificity. Um, but they do know, you know, and they hear from the media some and their peers a lot and what their peers are plugged into, that things are not, are not as they once were. I mean, it's very clear for their generation that it, that extends across multiple things. Uh, some of them positive, um, you know, they're a lot more enabled with, um, technology. I'm a lot more connected with that and a lot more able to do Zoom calls and uh, the younger one's a gamer and he's routinely on games with people from across the United States and in fact across the world, which, you know, in prior generations, we didn't begin to have the capability to do that. Um, but the flip side of it is he's aware too that the economic situation, especially now, has really taken a hit. But even before this, that it wasn't clear exactly what was what the future held um you know in terms of you know the kind of the classic american model of getting married and you know having a house and having kids and having a predictable life and predictable i think is a key word there the degree to which it's unpredictable is they realize is an order of magnitude higher than what people my age um, and in between experienced. Um, and, you know, and also the climate thing is of course another thing because there is the ongoing, um, you know, sequence of, you know, fires in Australia and the, the Amazon burning and on. And that just seems to be, it's, it's kind of back to Dar's um, column and truth out, was it's just a continuing set of things um, and if they're not local, some of them are big enough things that they make the international news because they, you know, like with Australia and the fires were a very big deal for a while. Um, and 
you know, it's, it, it's interesting for them. On the one hand, they don't necessarily want to talk about collapse stuff, but they're aware of it. Um, and it certainly changes their life plans. Uh, my oldest is now in grad school. Um, and she's, you know, has a, has a boyfriend. She just started grad school this year and has a boyfriend who started grad school as well that year. Um, and, you know, from what I hear from her, talking to her, um, and she's in Washington and I live in Colorado. And, you know, I, we talk fairly frequently, and especially now with all the COVID stuff going on, you know, not daily because she's real busy, but, you know, fairly, you know, try and keep in touch. Um, that, you know, for the, her generation, it's a question, well, will we have kids? Would we want to have kids? Would we have a normal enough life that that made any sense mm -hmm. um you know what's what's the world going to be like in five years when i get out of grad school presumably there'll be jobs and you know you, you you make a lot of assumptions about the future that allow you to at least nominally rationally organize your life to proceed into the future but with this heightened degree of uncertainty it's like hmm um you know how much of this how much of this makes sense and um i mean i i've i've gone through phases of this you know and it's in um to having uh done organizational change management stuff professionally a little bit i've done a lot of things around software engineering and a piece of it was that and part of that is it's about in an organization uh, i was lucky i learned from one of the guys that was a guru that field back in the you know, 90s into 2000s, early 2000s, that a negative change is a change you can't change. That's what makes it negative. When a loved one dies, when you get a terminal illness, or when the bank you're working for decides that they're going to merge with another bank, and then they did tell you that half the jobs are going away. And you're at the level in the bank where you don't get to choose whether this is happening or not. You don't get to choose about whether you get happens to you or not, or your group or not, you know. And so anytime there's a, a you know, kind of a, a change, a negative change, a change you can't change, you go through the whole grief cycle. And one of the really shocking things to me, you know, back in 2015 into 16, was realizing what this impacts with the future. You know, it's not, again, being Buddhist, it's one of those things I've known for years, decades, that my life is of finite duration. If you happen to notice, it's like my teacher's teacher was fond of pointing out, very few people make it to 100. Nobody makes it to 200. It just doesn't happen. So individually, you know you're gonna go, you know. But the collapse stuff is really the loss of the collective future. It's the thing that there won't be a seventh generation down the pike. There might not be a third generation down the pike, depending on how long the time scale is of that and all. And, you know, the shock of that was for me quite an experience. And I went through, you know, personally, a whole grief process of that, that, you know, first is the shock and then is the anger and it's the classic stuff because it induces that kind of response in people. And the, the more catastrophic the change is, and the more you can't change it, I think the more that induces that, you know, that just amps up the response. And, and thinking about the impact of that too on them uh, was a piece of that. Um, and I, I've kind of, as I've gone through that process, it's been interesting because it's changed how I am and it's also changed how I've related to them because you know, at first you're in shock and you tend to want to share the shock, essentially. You just can't believe it. You've read this stuff. Have you seen, have you seen this one? And I think of Dar as kind of, you know, I know him a little bit and personally, and he's kind of gone through a similar kind of evolution that, you know, it's like, okay, I was writing the truth out column and it's like this month's thing is crazy. And then the next month's thing is even crazier still. And it's like the shock, just the shock that just keeps reverberating. Um, and for sure, you, you, you go through an anger phase of that. And, you know, to this day, there's an element of me because, you know, those phases of grief are not linear necessarily. 
I think of them as really almost more layering on top of each other. Sure. In no particular order, really. No. Although, yeah, they do tend to emerge in the old classic Kubler-Ross order, kind of. But yeah, and then once once they've emerged, then it's just a big soup and it's just, you know, and you, it's like you quantum mechanically tunnel in between them and today I'm in this or in this moment I'm in this. And it can literally be, uh, part of this too is about learning to work with your emotions. And maybe I'll talk about that in a sec, but you know, you do kind of bounce in between these in kind of a very unpredictable way, you know, um, mm -hmm. because things will trigger you. Uh, thoughts will trigger you, things you see will trigger you, um, new stuff you read will trigger you, um, you know, and the anger phase is there uh, because of, you know, um, well, it, it, like an, an example of that that I think is it's, it's anger or rage or outrage, some emotion kind of like that. And um, another thing I've gotten involved with the last couple of years is Extinction Rebellion. Um, I've been helping organize it here in the United States. You know, it started in the United Kingdom. And one of the founders of that, Roger Hallam, who's a fairly controversial guy, um, he's prone to saying some pretty controversial things. And one of them he said fairly recently was talking about basically genocide and the genocide that happened in World War II and the ecological genocide that's happening against all the younger generations and everything that lives on Earth. And once you understand the scope of that, which I think was what Roger was trying to communicate, he didn't do maybe such a good job of doing that. But if you understand the scope of that, it really is, again, it's one of those unprecedented things. It, it is unprecedented as COVID-19. There's never been anything in human history where we've, and it's we, the various countries, we, the people in countries, we, the corporations, we, the governments, have kind of all collectively um, conspired would be one word or certainly engaged in behaviors that drive this thing the way it's going, you know, and, and, and in response to realizing there's that level of genocide happening, there is a, a certain amount of natural outrage that arises. Um, and that was kind of the, part of the motivation, to be honest, as I understand it, for Extinction Rebellion. Um, now, there he took a particular form, their solution, he advocates a particular solution about tell it, you know, getting the government to tell the truth about what's happening is one is really kind of, to me, the cornerstone of what they're about, especially in the UK, uh, which is a, a darn good beginning. And it's back to the kind of the outrage phase and the shock phase of, you know, but everybody else doesn't want to be in the same shock I'm in. And everybody else doesn't want to go through the grief process I'm going through. And I learned that with my kids, and that was was an interesting um, thing to really realize that um, one side of it is the process that I'm going through doesn't necessarily translate to them directly, you know. Um, and my oldest is fond of pointing out the thing about kind of, well, dad, you know, you don't really know how bad it's going to be. You really don't know the timing. And it's like, yep, that's true. That's true. The indicators are pretty strong, but the details, more news tomorrow and more news next month and more news a year from now. Um, because again, it is that, you know, inexorable, you know, train wreck, but a fairly slow moving one, it would seem. Um, so that that's been interesting for me to go through the internal process of this and then get out into the the late you know there's there's after the the shock and the anger then you know the curve the classic uh, um, curve they draw for uh grieving takes a big dip and there's the depression phase and you know a lot of us who've been through this definitely go through the depression phase a lot of people, if they don't want to share shock or anger, they probably even want to share depression less. You know, because shock and anger are outbound volcanic kind of emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things like in Tibetan Buddhism, there's an interesting thing, just to summarize real quick, it's the idea that basically if, you, if something triggers you being angry, and you stay 
in the cycle of thinking about it and being angry and you're pumping it. Mm -hmm. You're in it. But if you stop doing that, it, eventually the, volca the volcanic eruption subsides. And once it subsides, there tends to be this ability to see with actually surprising clarity that this is what I'm mad at and this is what triggered it. And, you know, very specific because you really sort of see that if you can get out of the, let the anger just naturally dissipate. Um, or sublimate or whatever fancy word you want to use there. Um, so, you know, that's cool because then you understand more about that and you're not stuck in anger all the time. Um, those are outbound emotions. You know, depression is more an implosion versus an explosion. And if explosions are tough for other people to deal with, implosions are probably even worse um, in my experience with them because it's like, you know, and how it is, especially in American society, if you, it's kind of the, again, the pump, pumping it up thing. Um, you know, you can stay in your depression by feeding your depression and clinging to your depression. And if you just, you know, corkscrew yourself into the ground hard enough with that, and then, Lord forbid, you start medicating with, and you know how it is in American society, you can pick it, whatever your choice of thing is, you know, be it medicinal or behavioral or whatever, you know. Um, and I've seen in myself and I've seen other people, I think sometimes, you know, um, a way of fighting the depression of this, that I think sometimes some people are further along in this process than they kind of consciously will admit. And so in the depression phase, to fight the depression phase, I glue my face to my device. And it provides endless amusement. And it's always moving. And, you know, and it used to be TV, but now I have it in portable form with me just constantly. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, which is great, but it's terrible. Um, can I, can and, I pause you for a sec? Sure. I was wondering if we could just go back a couple of minutes ago. You were talking about at least your oldest and, and perhaps all your kids, I, I don't know, uh, really taking you to task. Well, you don't really know the timing and you don't really know exactly what's going to happen and so on. And I guess fair enough. Um, but I, if you don't mind me playing devil's advocate for a second, I, I just look at the past two months and I mean, I, truthfully, I've never been a big fan of the words climate change anyway. Uh, that's just not the way I've ever um, summarized anything remotely like the center of what we're grappling with. It is a fraction of what's going on, but that's just me. What I'm, what I'm trying to point at is in these past two months, we've been shown the immense fragility of our hyper industrialized and specialized global human operating system. And that fragility has, has been crushed, literally crushed. I'm curious, have you had any recent conversations with your youngins to be able to get their impression of, is this a significant border from their perspective, or is this something we're gonna swing back into business as usual mode in oh. three months, six months, a year, but one way or another, we're gonna get back up into the swing of things and off we go. I'm curious, have you had that conversation with them? Um, a little bit, not, not a lot. Um, some, um, and it's not, you know, it, it, to be honest, some of that's more like you're talking about the fragility and all, and and that is a that is a big deal because there's there's pragmatic concerns about that that are kind of shorter term. You know, that I have had conversations with them about, like the the kid in Washington, do they have food in the stores? Are the grocery stores still open? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, happily, the answer is yes, the stores are still open, and yes the stores and the Costco's and all that seem to have stuff in them kind of depends on what you're talking about. You know, for a while their toilet paper was in very short supply, you know, um, and 
one of the, I guess, a piece of that conversation I've had is, is I think there's the underlying assumption that things will at some point get back to normal, kind of. Um, mm -hmm. At least, you know, again, like in, in that specific context of, of, of stores being open, um, universities being open, so there's kids there, so everybody isn't attending university remotely. My youngest is attending uh, Boulder remotely. Uh, the older ones in Washington and that university is it being in Washington state is of course completely remote. They managed to make it through the term to the spring break. And then this term, none of the undergrads are there. Almost none of them. And so there is the assumption that at some point we'll probably go back to normal. At least there'll be elements of normal we'll go back to. Um, how soon that happens is the biggest kind of immediate concern because it's not clear whether that's well it's clear that's now not in a couple of weeks it's clear now that that's probably not in a couple of months it's probably not this semester for example if we get back to normal for the fall semester talking august september kind of time frame um that that would be good um my son's involved with gaming stuff and one of the um, organizations he's involved with is planning an event in Dallas in August. Mm -hmm. And so they're kind of assuming, at least at the moment, that things will be back to normal enough that you can have an event, have people together, and people will come there, and it'll be in that state of affairs again by August. Mm. Now, okay. he's he's has some trepidation about that, because looking at the situation, is like, hmm, might happen, but might not happen, especially with the gaming stuff because it's online. Do we, are we going to, to your question, is it back to things as it were before? Is it back to having, and he's been at a couple of these over the last couple of years, big events, you know, big places, Atlanta and San Jose and stuff where they have thousands of people involved. Um, are we going back to that kind of model of it or is it going to be all online? You know, are we are we going to change the world that way that everybody hopping on an airplane and just thinking nothing of going to Atlanta or going to wherever um, becomes hmm, more of a deal? That there's a lot less flights. You thought the security restrictions before, you know, because, you know, it's like I've heard um, in Asia, the whole thing about having the forehead scan for temperature and some of the stuff, the protocols they've put up that we haven't adopted in the United States, but at some point we seem to be kind of laggards on that, but at some point we might. And so is transportation going to go back to how it was? Well, boy, that, that one, especially that kind of thing, I think mm -hmm. they, you know, in the conversations I have with them, that one seems like that might take a while. Um, you know, is, what, you know, again, it's like the school year next year, what's going to happen? Well, okay, worst case, we'll just continue on with the video stuff and that'll be the new normal. Um, yeah. You know. Okay. Why I'm asking is, uh, from my point of view, this is uh, an economic collapse that is not going to come back. Uh, there might be an upswing to... a uh, something like a quarter of what we've known, but with that quarter will be the ultimate crushing of massive swaths of, of this human operating system. You know, just looking at the number of rents and mortgages that are gonna default within the next three months, uh -huh. that's far more than enough to completely collapse the global market, period. Just collapse it. But I, I don't want to go there because I really do want to keep it with you. And I, I'm understanding that so far I, I'm hearing you kind of describe what some of the main features are that, that your children are thinking about and that they're, they need to be concerned with what's on their screen and what's in front of them as their, as their uh, important concerns of the moment. So, you know, really my opinion or my, my perspective on this doesn't matter much here. And I, I guess I'd like to shift back to, it sounds like there 
there's not much concern yet because I think you're mentioning that everybody's in graduate school? Uh, college and graduate school. Yes. Okay. Well, that's a particular track that implies a certain amount of predictable future. Mm -hmm. And I'm hearing you say that they're, they're firmly in that and they, they are staying with that. And am I hearing right? Yeah, you are. And, and I think it's, it's one of those things that um, there's a couple pieces of it. One of them, it's sort of, you know, once you get into grad school, and especially working on a PhD, you're going to be doing that for a few years. And the mm -hmm. oldest has just started in that and is going to be at that for five, six years, somewhere in that range. Um, and, you know, um, and is hoping there's enough stability in that. I mean, one of the, one of the concerns she expresses is some of her professors are older and she's worried about them catching COVID and dying and what impact that would have on her in particular in the department in general and other graduate students and all that because you okay. assume continuity. Yeah. And especially nowadays, yeah. that, that, that predictability and that continuity uh, may be, you know, it, 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 it's, it's certainly less certain than it was six months ago. Mm-hmm. And, and, and perhaps dramatically less, although people, I think, tend to kind of push that thought away a little bit that they, because you know, that one gets pretty fright. And you know how that is. It's like, yeah, you know, I, again, I kind of have to assume things about the future in order to organize my life and have it make sense to sure. Yeah, you do. Um, the, the younger one is kind of in the middle of college and um, before all this, like I mentioned, was a gamer and the gaming industry worldwide is a big deal and becoming a bigger deal, or at least was becoming a bigger deal all the time. And presumably there will be some element of that reestablished um, in part because a lot of that was, it was not like, you know, American sports events where you have a lot of people go watch an American football game. It's not structured that way. Yep. And in fact, the thing that was crazy is at the university in, in Boulder, the, the gaming, once you, they were like, you know, of course the, the football, you know, got the most students involved it, it coming to the games, the basketball next, but gaming was number three already. The world has changed that much. And it just blew away the, fa the, the faculty and the, and the administration down there that they could put up gaming events that kids would want to come to be involved with from Friday evening to Sunday night which, you know, is a lot longer, of course, you know, so it's just, it's a yeah. different world and the world's continuing to evolve that way. So, yeah. um, you know, he's continuing on sort of assuming that this will at some point pan out and all make sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but yeah, it's, 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 it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's tough. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious Again, Tim, my, my experience of you is um, your very, very uh, up, to, up to date. You're very current with what's going on in, in uh, particular pockets, especially like activism with, with uh, your involvement with XR and, uh, and your ongoing keeping yourself pretty well informed, you know, similar to the, the trend you were talking about was staying in touch with, uh, with DAR and so on. I'm curious, especially given the shift of these last two months and what we're seeing globally, are there, are there particular aspects of this world and what's been going on that, that land harder on you than others? Oh, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's kind of multiple answers to that. Um, there's a, a personal one and then um, kind of more collective one. And the, the other thing that occurs to me, I do want to get back to talking about too, was far enough out in the grief cycle, turning it around and dealing with their grief, not mine. And I think that's another thing I want to get into. Um, mm. But yeah, things that land on me, I mean, personally, um, you know, because I am, am, am an avid outdoorsman, namely a skier, um, you know, this year, all of a sudden in March, bam, one weekend, 
it was over. Well, within a week, it was over. And they were thinking we would we would be closed for a couple of weeks. No, a couple of weeks turned into, and then everybody just pulled the plug and the whole season went away. Uh, which illustrates how fast that can happen. Um, being, and again, you're, you're talking about virus related stoppage, not- Right, medical. exactly, exactly. Yeah. And yeah, and, and, and the unemployment that came with it, the economic impact that came with it, some of the counties in Colorado basically tried to get everybody who was a tourist or a visitor or a seasonal worker out. Would all of you please leave? Let people who are residents of the county back in and some of them, literally the county sheriff was checking IDs. You know, not complete quarantine, but you know, pretty pretty intense stuff. Um, so that happened very abruptly and was very jarring and very disappointing and very sad. And it is one of the things you know, in that kind of thing, you go through it every season. There's always the end, and it's the the thing like the uh, uh, Pima Chodron quote about that you live by dying repeatedly. And so I practice dying in a sense the end of every season. But it's more predictable because you know when the dates are. If you're lucky, it'll get extended a little bit. But this year, all of a sudden, bam, it's just like accidentally being hit by lightning out on the golf course. Yeah. yeah. And the next thing you know, you're laying there dead. Um, and that was, that was a shocking aspect of it. The background part of it is being Dar's field correspondent and having been, you know, spent two years out of the last 15 outdoors, to give you kind of a quantifier thing and i've seen it change so much in the last 15 or almost 20 years nowadays in the high country that it's clear on the trajectory we were going on eventually there won't be a whole lot of skiing there won't be a whole lot of winter um people don't realize that two degrees centigrade is the difference between the climate in albuquerque and the climate in denver if you think about those two historics Albuquerque's already, Denver's already halfway to Albuquerque. It's headed south. Another degree C will be in Albuquerque. Albuquerque will be in, you know, and, and, and so given that long-term trend, yeah, it's like kind of, you know, enjoy it while it lasts because the assumption, I know I won't go on, but, you know, um, kind of the realization that there may not be winters in Colorado at some point and all the consequences of that is yeah. one thing. No, I, I, uh, I pretty rudely took you off this particular, onto this loop. And you've mentioned that you really wanted to get back to speaking about a particular, a couple of facets of your experience of grief. Do you want to return there? Yeah. Um, yeah, because one of them was actually the next thing. And then the, ne the one was talking about your kid's grief and not so much mine, but turning the tables is well. Yeah. The other thing that, that this has impacted me is like, um, and it's, it's an intense personal aspect and it has to do with the grief stuff and being in multiple places in that cycle at once and being Buddhist and kind of all of it all mixed together. And it can surface in surfaces often in the example of walking down the mall in Boulder and seeing some young kid, you know, child, um, doesn't quite, maybe not, you know, with older kids, it's a little bit different reaction, but with the younger ones and then with their parents and having the thought arise, wow, I wonder how that child's life will be. I wonder how long that child will be alive. I wonder what future they will have, especially given all the stuff that's going on. Um, and there's tremendous sorrow associated with that because their life probably won't be you know, is it otherwise would have been, you know, will they ever be my age? Perhaps not. Mm. Um, now, mind you, that's counterbalanced being a Buddhist by the thing of tremendous joy. It really, once you get to the sorrow, if you can let the sorrow penetrate, it opens up the opportunity to see the joy that, that they talk about in Buddhist teachings of how precious a gift it is to have a human life to begin with and to get to be born as a human, however long your life happens to turn out. And, you know, back in the old days, before there's so much modern medicine, some people live long lives, some people would live shorter lives, you know, it, it'd vary. Um, but just that whole um, 
really seeing that because you see, you know, it, it's a Martin Prechtel kind of thing in a way of you you grieve for it because you praise it. You you grieve for its loss because you value it so much. And whether that be the natural world or your own future or your kid's future or whatever, um, you know, that's how that is. And and that's really a good segue too to the, the, the thing I did want to mention was, um, yeah, you know, when you get into all this, it's about my grief and my depression and my, you know, my, 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 whatever. Um, eventually, far enough out on that, you kind of get to a, the equivalent of an acceptance phase. And one of the things that opens up is the opportunity to kind of look up and not be looking, you know, kind of straight down at your own feet all the time and look up and see what's going on around you and realize that your kids are going through some degree of that process themselves, whether they articulate it or not, excuse me, even to some extent, whether they're consciously aware of it or not. It's like in the, I forget there's a German term for that, but it's like a thought that's way in the back of your mind that you have to really look at and try and explicitly think about it to pull it far enough forward that you can get it into language. And in the XR community in the UK, it was started about a talk that was all about the uh, environment and biological aspect of the collapse and all of that. And that's referred to colloquially as the talk. But in the UK, in the Extinction Rebellion world, there's the other talk. And the other talk is the conversation you have with your kids about how their future and their lifespan may not be what they'd anticipated or hoped for. And being willing to engage in that conversation and sort of roll it out there and then sit and be with them and shut up and listen and see where they're at and see where they are in their grief and be willing to be with their grief. And to the extent that I've done with that with my kids a bit, which I have, the thing that's really powerful about that is when you share your grief with others and their grief isn't the same as yours, but there's resonance and there's commonality. And sometimes there's hugs and, you know, nowadays it's tough with, you know, six foot distancing. Um, and sometimes there's tears and sometimes there's joy. And, um, you know, that one, that one is really, I think, part of the deeper part of the practice of this, of just, you know, day by day, moment by moment, being willing to be with your own grief being to, willing to be with other people's grief and just be open to that and be willing to, you know, it's like one of my favorite things that I cite fairly often is the old Billy holiday thing about good morning, heart, heartache, come in, sit down. Don't try and hide from it. Don't try and run away from it. Be willing to be with it. And heartache will come and he or she, however you envision, will come and sit down and be with you for a while especially if it's a tough morning mm -hmm. and you'll have your coffee and by noon it'll be different. Yeah. And be willing to be that open. And in that sense, sort of alive, because it really is the, you know, the Pima children thing too, about um, the way my teacher phrases it is let every moment be fresh when dealing with self and other. And if you can get to that point of being a, a literally utterly abandoning preconception in that way that's quite an accomplishment um and you know in a piece of it too is abandoning thinking of this is a good emotion and that's a bad emotion and trying to select them and squelch them and you know um because emotional, one form of emotional stability is you can reduce it down to zero. That's one form of emotional stability. 
Another form of that, I think, is a more dynamic sense of it, because that's kind of a static sense, if you think about it. Another sense of it is not getting stuck in any one emotion, letting them just flow through you and letting them flow through the other person and being willing to be there with them and um, recognize that there's times they'll be happy and you'll be sad and vice versa. And there's times you'll both be happy and there's times you'll both be sad. And that's, you know, the ongoing practice of this. I mean, there's, there really is such a tremendous practice aspect of this. Yeah. Like I say, once you quit denying and quit hiding is really kind of one way to put that. Yeah. Here's that uh, Marion Woodman quote about, um, I'm going to paraphrase it here to, to um, try and face the crazy predicament filled world that we have going on without having a strong set of spiritual practices is as crazy as running headlong into a forest fire wearing only a paper tutu. <laughs> I like that one. Yes. Yes, because you, you do, it really helps to have something that can kind of ground you and, um, and, and to the, the really harder part I've discovered over the years, like dealing with my kids and the collapse and, you know, and all of this is, is sometimes um, it, it, there's a tendency I've noticed to, it's the thing about emotions and it's, it's the thing about labeling them good and bad and squelching the intensity of them that we can, we can use kind of the formal Dharma or any kind of practice in one way to soothe ourselves or to try and comfort ourselves, which is okay. But if you notice that's what you're doing it for, I think there's a level of honesty that's helpful to realize I'm doing this to try and run away from the feelings I don't want to have. And so if I notice, oh, I want to sit on the cushion and when it gets bad, I want to sit on the cushion more. And if it gets really bad, I want to really sit on the cushion more. Well, you know, in, in a way, that's okay. But you are doing what you're doing if you're doing it. And, you know, some, you, know you know how that is. It's a, that, that one's a tough one, too, because it's like um, you want to remain grounded, but like I say, not just drive it to zero is the only viable solution. Because to me, that just, that feels very forced. And that's part of the whole thing about the freshness of the moment with self and other is right. just watching the feelings go by. And there's, I forget the band, there's a song from like the nineties or something, but it's like, you know, how you're a thousand different people across the course of a day. There's just yeah. literally moment to moment. And the degree to which that's true is sometimes just stunning. Yeah. It, uh, the words I might use for what the two things you're describing here is, that uh, com compressing it down into one thing and it, that seems like a control strategy and that, that uh, openness to the moment, that freshness that you're describing, that thousand people in a day that I'm allowing to come forth, that seems closer to a, another piece that I might call a liquid state mm. where uh, I, um, instead of the default mode that we've all grown up with, which is to repel our back from, to uh, avoid at all costs, the kind of uncertainty that gives us that quicksand feeling in our own center mm -hmm. of everything's falling apart. There's nothing I can hold on to. <laughs> yeah. And that liquid state, what I've seen in, in advanced practices is that there's there's a, a line over which you you get to cross it, I, that I've experienced crossing it, it where I actually start to lean into it. It becomes so familiar. Yes, it's still disorienting and, and uncomfortable as hell. Mm -hmm. But I've been through it enough and I've I've survived. 
Yeah. And, and there's been this, this level of aliveness that's been added to my experience by, by leaning into it. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hearing when you're describing what you're describing. Yeah, 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 that's it. Yeah, you know, another way I've, I've heard it put that's kind of strange um, uh, out of the Buddhist world is the bad news is you're falling out of the airplane without a parachute. That's the bad news. The good news is there is no ground. Ah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Once you get used to falling, what's the problem? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And and that's where I think it's like what you're describing is is that state of of, of uh, liquidness of flow is just being willing to be in that ungrounded state and realize that's really kind of how things are and eh, this isn't so bad this is really what life's about and it it's it opens up a lot of things to be quite vivid sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Yeah. You know, so. And, and again, it's one of those things I think, too, if you, if you can practice that with yourself, you can practice it with your kids. You know, it's one of those things that the more open you can be that way, you know, it's, it's sort of the, it's, it's the opposite of kind of an emotional codependent sort of thing. Mm -hmm. of, I'm not so stuck on how I want to feel that I insist that you have to agree with me. And when I'm angry, you got to be angry. And when I'm sad, you got to be sad right. that I'm, I'm willing to let go of all of that and get to the point of, well, I'm watching it go by in me. And if I notice closely, I'm watching it go by in you. And, you know, sometimes if I can do that, then when they need a hug, I give them a hug. Yeah. And when they need to talk, as much as I talk, I try and shut up and listen. <laughs> um, yeah. And if they disagree, I let them disagree. Um, because, you know, that's another piece of that whole thing, too. It's just like, because there's so much unknown, if we try and make it all an argument about facts and future and predicting the future, then, you know, that's just an endless digression in the nonsense. Yes, it is. And it's just that kind of argument is especially useless, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but we're, you got to admit, we're very good at it in the United States. Oh, Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's where, you know, another uh, Denver guy I know, David Sirota, um, used to be this thing about he would stipulate when he was arguing with, with people of certain political persuasions that, no, we are not going to argue that the sky is blue. The stipulation is the sky is blue. If you don't want to agree with that premise, we're not going to talk. Just period. Not going to talk. And, you know, because we, we sometimes, you know how that is, especially in sort of political stuff, you know, it just, and, I, and it gets so ideological. And, yeah. you know, it's like, like um, I've heard said, you know, the problem with ideology is if you cling to it high, too hard, it turns into idiotology. It makes you into an idiot. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're, like you say, in the United States, we're pretty good at being stuck. <laughs> we're pretty good. Well, Tim, it, it seems to me to be a, a good place to draw our conversation to a close. And I, I particularly appreciate this last loop that you brought us in back to being with, with, the par with your own children um, be they adult children or, or younger, to be able to be open and invite uh, really the truth of the moment for both of you, in yourself and in them. I was going to ask you one of the last question that I usually ask is, is what you might offer in terms of not necessarily advice, but for people who don't have your depth of psycho spiritual practice, and, you know, the, over the years that you've got, uh, what might you offer? And I, to me, it it really just um, I didn't need to ask that question with what you were just sharing. So I, I just want to appreciate that and appreciate how easily you were able to dance back and forth between your own experience and sharing that, and then your experience as a parent 
And uh, I really appreciate you sharing about that as well. That's, that's been uh, very useful for me and, and I'm not a parent myself. And uh, yet I've, I've certainly done my share of proxy parenting in youth programs for decades. I so appreciate you taking the time to share what it's like for you, um, just from your perspective and from a parenting perspective. Is there anything you'd like to say to, to just close it up for yourself? Um, I guess one thought is, yeah, but my, my kids are a particular age and depending on the age of somebody's kids, you know, part of this is, is it, it's, it's analogous to what we were talking about a, a moment ago in a way. It's being willing to be with them on the path they're traversing as they traverse it. <laughs> this one gets real hard because it's getting down to the very core of it. That in the natural order of things, you're the, the parent birds and they're the baby birds and they will in due turn fly away. Mm -hmm. So you have to be willing to let go of them. But while they're there with you, across from little kids, and especially if you have little kids in this day and age, yeah. and then once they get into grade school, and then once they get into middle school, and so forth, and being willing to be there with them, progressively let go as they emerge into adolescence and then ultimately beyond. Um, but do know you will always be their parent. You will always be a part of where they came from. And they're always from there. No yeah. matter what you would call time. It's an illusion of time that sure. that's the past. It's still as true now yeah. as it was then. Maybe let me leave it there. Tim Rimple, thank you so much for taking this time. I look no, forward to you. our next time to get together whenever that might be, possibly the next Safe Circle call. Oh, yeah, yeah. I hope so, Dean. Yeah, no, this was, this was good. All right. Thanks for watching another episode of the Poetry of Predicament podcast. Produced by Dean Walker and the Living Resilience Alliance, www.livingresilience.net. Also available on our website, www.livingresilience.net, is a wide array of articles, online learning series, arranging group and individual resilience coaching, and sign up for our every other Tuesday free support group that we call Safe Circle Calls.